Hello, friend. Welcome to the Whole Word Podcast. This is Pastor Pitts Evans. On this podcast, we read and discuss one chapter of God's Word per episode. Let's go now to the Bible and see what the Lord has for us today. We're about to go through one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, Romans 8. And I just want to say a little bit about it before I read. The New Testament has a lot to say about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes as Christians, we underemphasize who the Holy Spirit is in terms of the Godhead. He's part of the Trinity. He is as much God as God the Father and as Jesus, God the Son. The Holy Spirit is indeed God, but we often relegate the Holy Spirit to something less than the status that we afford to God the Father and God the Son. And so Romans chapter 8 is all about living life led by the Holy Spirit. It's about life in the Spirit. And uh, if you ever want to study um, how to live as a Christian, Romans chapter 8 is a good place to begin because it talks about leading life uh, led by the Spirit. And so as we get into this, I want you to just think about the Holy Spirit and your relationship with the Holy Spirit and the relationship the Holy Spirit desires to have with you. You see, He is much more than some invisible force or a chill bump or the wind or the heat or any description you want to use. Uh, He is a person. He has his own personality. He has his own mind. He makes his own decisions. And yes, sometimes he speaks on behalf of the Father. Sometimes he speaks to us on behalf of the Son. But he also operates independently. And there are many aspects of our life as believers in Christ that are tremendously affected by the person and work of the Holy Spirit. So be thinking about life in the Spirit as I read now from Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be an offering for sin. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but live according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Holy Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you're in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you will put to death the misdeeds of the body, and you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we're God's children, Now, if we're God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs along with Christ, if we indeed share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, 
in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that cannot be expressed. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God's working for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to all of this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword separate us? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Of course, chapter 8 builds on what was taught in chapter 7. In chapter 7, we learn that Jesus, the Anointed One, has set us free from the law of sin and death. And so chapter 8 begins, Therefore, since we've been set free from the law of sin and death, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives you life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And so, friends, in the Holy Spirit, we're no longer controlled by our old Adamic nature. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. It's also referred to as the Spirit of Christ in Romans 8, verse 9. Not two different spirits, by the way. The Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ are both one and the same. So if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. You're able to be led by the Spirit. And the, the Holy Spirit is credited as the one who leads us in our walk on earth uh, once we become a believer. The Holy Spirit is also credited with the responsibility for our future resurrection in what we just read. The same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead will raise me from the dead in due season and will raise you from the dead in due season. In this uh, chapter, we read in verse 13, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit and you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. That's one of the hallmarks of a true believer. Uh, I don't know that you have to be led moment by moment. I know people could be silly about these things. But if you're a Christian, at some point in time, you need to be led by the Holy Spirit. You need to be able to point and say, this is where the Lord led me in this instance, in that instance. Those are hallmarks. Those are proof of the fact that you are indeed a child of God. Verse 15, the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again, but rather the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. 
And so I just want to make a quick comment on that. The great John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church and Methodism, was an Anglican priest, but he didn't know the Lord yet. And so he took a voyage to America, and uh, the the trip was very um, dangerous. The boat almost went down in a terrible storm. And on the boat, there were a group of Moravians that were not at all afraid to die. They weren't afraid of the storm. So Wesley wanted to talk about their theology. Why aren't you afraid? Why aren't your wives afraid? Tell me what you people think. You know, what's your, what's your belief in Scripture? And they were not able to argue with the great theologian. So they said, talk to our bishop when we get to Savannah, Georgia. So Wesley presented himself to Bishop A.G. Spanglenberg in Savannah, Georgia, upon their arrival, and said, tell me about your theology. And Spanglenberg says, I want to ask you a question. And he asked him from Romans chapter 8, verse 16, do you have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit that you're a born-again child of God? And Wesley lied. He said he did, but he didn't. That encounter drove Wesley to seek the Lord until he was indeed born again, because the Holy Spirit himself testifies to our spirit, we're the children of God. And when confronted, Wesley did, realized he did not have that inner witness of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to pray into that now. Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit, you would search our hearts. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would make intercession for us before the throne of God. And Lord, if we do not have that inner witness of the Spirit, I pray today we would be born again, that those that are listening would enter into God's redemptive plan for their lives. But Lord, those brothers and sisters of mine that are living for Christ and have doubts about their own salvation, remind them of the times that the Holy Spirit has led them. Remind them of that inner witness of the Holy Spirit, that they are indeed born-again children of the living God. Amen. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Whole Word. It was brought to you by Whole Word Fellowship and the Northern Virginia House of Prayer. If you were encouraged, please share our podcast with your friends. We'd also appreciate it if you'd hit subscribe in your favorite podcast app and take a few moments to write a review. If you'd like more information on our church and our ministry, you can go to wholeword.net or wholewordpodcast.com for more information. Thank you again, and may the Lord Jesus bless you today and always.